Um, I meant to say, of course, uh, at the beginning, I forgot, I was so excited about showing the clip that um, Paddington unfortunately finds himself in prison uh, at one point in the film. I'm sure you've seen it, and uh, there is a little picture of Paddington's life in prison. I'll come back to that in a few moments. Um, around the turn of the 19th century, as we went into the 20th century, there was a huge amount of optimism um, in the world in something called progress. And uh, we, uh, in the West, we've been through the Enlightenment. During that period of time, there have been a huge number of incredible scientific discoveries, many of which we are enjoying right now. Lights, for example. And uh, there was just a huge amount of optimism that the shackles of the old ways have been thrown off, the old ways of superstition and the religious practices of the world had sort of been sort of thrown off and there was a sense in which people were now free to properly think for themselves. No longer did the state or the church tell you what to think, but people were now free to think for themselves. There was the sense of great sort of momentum around it, educating the masses and there was just this sense of optimism that human beings were now free to be, to think and to progress huge amount of optimism as we went into the 20th century because of that. But of course um, it's well documented that you come to the end of the 20th century and almost all of that optimism in progress had dwindled away. Because it is well documented that the 20th century was the most violent century that there had ever been. More wars in the 20th century than there had ever been, it's estimated, in the whole history of humankind. The, 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 you don't need me to tell you the details, but you'll know, of course, that there were two world wars, millions of people caught up in conflict all around the world. The Holocaust, the invention of nuclear weapons, the use of nuclear weapons, genocides all across the earth. And of course there are moments of progress, there are wonderful steps forward in the 20th century, but generally speaking, by the end of it, there was a sense in which that optimism that was there at the beginning of the century had faded. Because actually, when human beings are left to their own devices, what they generally create is something like the 20th century. When we're left to our own devices, what we seem to do is create war and conflict and hurt and pain. And um, that is actually, I think, the picture that the Bible paints time and time and time again. If you read through the Old Testament, it doesn't matter which part of the Old Testament you turn to, if you read a section of the Old Testament, whether it's the first 11 chapters of Genesis, whether it's the story of the Exodus, whether it's the story of the period of time called the Judges, whether it's the story of the Kings, what you generally find is that human beings create a mess. That actually, rather than being on a natural trajectory towards progress, actually when left to themselves, human beings are, generally speaking, on a trajectory towards decay. That's what the Bible tells us, certainly what it tells us in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, some people say, is it's a, it's a story looking for an answer. Because actually whatever part of the Old Testament you turn to, you find a downward spiral. You find that sin has so infiltrated every single human being, that every human being is so prone towards sinfulness, that actually when left to themselves, generally speaking, the progress, uh, the, the, the trajectory is down. The trajectory is towards decay and human beings desperately need an answer. Well, that's a bit depressing, isn't it? <laughs> Do you know what? Um, that isn't all the Bible says. It's not all the Bible says. The Bible does paint that picture. I think the Bible is really real about that picture. I think the Bible is absolutely right when it makes that point. But it isn't the only thing that the Bible says. Because the Bible says that actually the question is continually asked throughout the Old Testament is answered in 
the person of Jesus Christ. He is the answer to the question that the stories of the Old Testament pose over and over and over again. And Jesus in this passage says something that is absolutely amazing. It's so important to understand and to grasp and to keep a hold of what Jesus says in these few verses. This is what Jesus says to a people, to a society, to a world that generally speaking, rather than being on a trajectory towards progress, is on a trajectory towards decay. What he says to the people gathered on that mountainside is he says to them, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Before I talk about the salt, let me talk about the you. Who was Jesus speaking to as he delivers this sermon on the mountainside? Jesus isn't talking to the President of the United States. Jesus isn't talking to the Pope. He isn't talking to Billy Graham or Mother Teresa. Jesus is talking to the ordinary people of Galilee. This is not the highly educated, there may have been educated people there, but he's not talking to a crowd of academics, a crowd of priests, a crowd of world leaders. He is talking to the ordinary men, the ordinary women, the ordinary children of Galilee. And he looks at them and he says, you are the salt of the earth. The thing that marked them out, the only thing that marks them out, is that these people were drawn to Jesus. These people had gathered around Jesus. I believe that these people, it talks at the beginning, it says before, as, as it introduces the sermon, it says, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down, his disciples came to him. In other words, the people that gathered around him were people that had put their trust in Jesus. They were people that were trying to figure out, how do I live my life like those Beatitudes that Sharon spoke about last week? What does it look like to live my life like Jesus lives his life? That was the only thing that marked them out. Dallas Willard said the people that gathered around Jesus on that day when he preached the Sermon Mount were the spiritual zeros. But they knew that they had found themselves in Jesus and they were there because they wanted to learn how to live their life like Jesus <coughs> lived his. They were people that recognised their own spiritual poverty and their desperate need for him. And Jesus looks at them Ordinary people, ordinary people like me, ordinary people like you. And he looks at them and he says, you are the salt of the earth. What an amazing thing for him to say. Why did he say that? What was so important about salt? Well, salt in the ancient world had uh, two primary purposes. The first and the most important purpose of salt, or use of salt, was that it preserved and it cleansed. The second use of salt, of course, was that it adds flavour to the meal. If you, uh, in Jesus' day, were having a great party on Sunday, you'd invite your, your friends and your family around, you'd bought yourself a lovely, great, long fillet of beef to be roasted on the Sunday morning, and you'd bought it at the butcher's on Tuesday, you had a major problem because you didn't have a fridge. What were you going to do with your seriously expensive fillet of beef? Because if you leave it on the side in your little house in Capernaum with the heat and all that, it is going to rot. It is going to decay and there is nothing that you can do to stop it. It is on a trajectory towards decay. The bacteria, the germs that are in it, the bacteria, the germs that will land upon it will cause that piece of meat to rot. There's nothing you can do to stop it other than covering it in salt. And if you cover <clears throat> your really expensive beef fillet in salt, you can preserve that piece of meat for weeks, 
maybe even for months. It was so precious. Salt was so precious. When you couldn't pop down to curries and buy a fridge, salt was the answer. They salted their food and they preserved it. And salt prevented it from decay. And salt cleansed it. And Jesus says to the people gathered on that mountainside, to a society that was on a downward spiral towards decay, he says, you are the salt of the world. You are the salt of the earth. It's you that cleanse. It's you that preserve. That's who you are. The second thing is that salt brings flavour. Salt brings flavour. There's a few moments in the scriptures where um, the wisdom of heaven or the sort of culture of heaven is sometimes described in, in a way but by references to the salt, to salt. And I think what Jesus is saying to the people is not just that you, you are the people that preserve and cleanse but you are the people that bring the flavour of heaven. That's what you do. You bring the flavour of heaven to the place that you're in. You are the salt of the earth. Of course, Jesus later on goes and speaks about them being the light of the world. And in much the same way, um, light does similar things. Light brings life, life, light brings benefit, light protects, light creates safety, light enables people to go about in a way that enables them to flourish. I, I don't know, uh, I have a, our bed in our bedroom is... Um, we don't have beds in other rooms, we only have them in the bedroom. Um, but um, our bed in our bedroom is... Julie seems, the way it's organised, Julie sort of seems to have about 10 square metres outside of bed. And I have about, I don't know, one square metre. At best, I'm sort of pressed up against the wall. And uh, we have a wooden bed frame. And um, honestly, I'm of an age where about 3.30 in the morning, you set your clock by it, have to get up, take a little trip to the loo, which fortunately is nearby. And, um, on, on the way back, uh, it's dark, and uh, the number of times that I bang my shin on the corner of the bed, it is so painful. And of course, I, being a good husband, I wouldn't want to wake my wife. And uh, I get into bed, and I'm lying there, and I'm like, ah, it's so painful. I'm rubbing it, I'm trying to, it's just agony. It's because I can't see when the light is on. I never bang my ship on the bed. Because light enables us <coughs> to function and to flourish. Light brings life. Jesus says to them, you're the light of the world. I showed that picture, the, the video from Paddington. I remember watching that film in the, in the cinema. I, all, I felt like I just wanted to cry when I watched that clip. It was so, I found it so powerful and so moving. Because Paddington, I mean, that story, he, he finds himself in prison, as I said, and it's a, pretty, it's, a, it's a pretty awful place to be. As you would expect, there's a guy called Knuckles McGinley, if you remember, who's the prison chef, and he's also an inmate, and he just makes life miserable for everybody, and it's, everything's grey, and the food is awful. And you'll remember, there's this great scene where Paddington squirts um, ketchup on the guy's apron by mistake. And, just, and then in the end, he ends up stuffing a marmalade sandwich in the guy's mouth. And it begins to transform everything. And actually, Paddington, uh, that's just a little clip. It's so good to watch the whole thing. But Paddington, just by being him, <laughs> just by being himself in that place, begins to bring this incredible transformation to it. He, I mean, I don't know, I don't think the filmmaker was necessarily thinking this in his mind, but it's interesting, isn't it, that actually the song that plays in the background is the words of Jesus, love your neighbour as yourself. 
And there's a sense in which in that in, it's like an incredible <coughs> depiction of the kingdom of God coming to a community. It's an incredible depiction of, um, of the flavour of heaven coming to a place where there is just fear and oppression and uh, misery. And uh, Paddington brings something of the flavour of heaven to that place. And that's what Jesus says to them. Jesus says to those people listening, and Jesus says to you, you're the soul of the earth. You preserve, you cleanse, you bring the flavour of heaven. There's a few things that Jesus points out, though, that we have to also kind of bear in mind. And um, it's important to hear this. The first thing, I think, is that Jesus says the soul has to... I'm kind of combining the two metaphors of soul and life, but I hope, I hope it works. He says... Um, the soul has to be dispersed. The soul has to be distinct. And the light has to be visible. It has to be dispersed. It has to be distinct. It has to be visible. It has to be dispersed. I don't know if you remember um, back in the day, some of you uh, will be far too young to remember these. They were probably, I think they were one of the worst inventions ever. Salt and shake crisps. They were rubbish. Honestly, I remember at primary school, went through a phase where like, it seemed like they were quite cool, they were quite novel. I saw one of my mates have, oh, we should get some. They looked brilliant. Got my mum to buy them, probably against her will because they were probably more expensive than the normal lot that we got. But had these crisps and thought, oh, this is so cool, shot salt and shake crisps. And yet, what it was for those of you who have no idea what to talk about, it was a bag of basically plain crisps and absolutely zero flavour whatsoever and within the bag was a sachet of salt and the idea was that you could tear the salt sachet, sprinkle it in and then shake the bag of crisps to bring this beautiful flavour to life. They were useless because my experience was that you, did, you went through the process which seemed quite fun and then you would put first crisp in your mouth and there would be, there'd be no flavour. What? You're rubbish. Shake the bag again. Next crisp, no flavoured, utterly horrible, just no flavour. Another crisp, oh, no flavour. Get to the sixth crisp, put it in your mouth. All of the salt <laughs> is on that one crisp. And it was just, and you'd have to get water. Give me the water, give me the water. You'd be crying out for water, keep the dinner, I need water. And uh, you'd have to drink so much. And eventually you'd recover from the shock of it, and then you'd go again and you'd eat another crisp, no flip. The rest of the bag, no flip. Just the most useless invention. I don't think you can get any more terrible things. You can. You're kidding me. I had a packet on Thursday. Were they useless? <laughs> For the sake of my illustration, Jim, you have to say yes. They were useless. They weren't very good. They weren't very good. No. Exactly. Ridiculous. Anyway, so don't buy them, don't be fooled. Um, anyway, the point, of course, with the bag of crisps a packet of chips, a, you know, whatever, is the soul has to be dispersed. It has to be dispersed. One of the things the Christian community has done over the years is it's, tried, is it's just simply gathered together, huddled together, monasteries, I'm not against, not against that, um, all those sort of things, um, creating its own subcultures and ghettos and all that kind of stuff. But actually what Jesus says is, no, the soul has to be dispersed. It's got to be out there. One of my favourite uh, Sundays ever here at St Philip's since I've been here was a Sunday, it was a few Januaries ago, I think it was before the pandemic. I'd, I'd had a conversation with Bishop Simon. I said to Bishop Simon, would you come to our church and ordain the ordinary? I don't know if you remember that. And he came and he talked about, um, and, and he talked about sort of this sort of thing. And then at the end he said, anybody who wants to come and be ordained to the small O, uh, come up. And, I'll, and I'd love to pray for them. And there's a queue of people, loads of people came forward and he prayed for them. And the point of that space is that the soul has to be dispersed. It has to be in education. It has to be in healthcare. It has to be in business. It has to be in the arts. It has to be in the government. If it's just in the church, that is, that is not the picture that Jesus paints. The soul has to be dispersed. And I want a Bishop Simon to come and in some way lay his Episcopal hands upon people and say, actually, your ministry 
in those places is as important as any missionary or vicar or TV evangelist. It's, it's, the soul has to be dispersed for it to be effective. The second thing is that it has to be distinct. It has to be distinct. Jesus said if soul loses its saltiness, it is of no value. You just chuck it out, trample it underfoot, because if the salt is like the meat, it has no impact. The salt has to be distinct. There has to be something about us that is different from the world. There has to be something about the way we think. There has to be something about the way we speak. There has to be something about the way that we act that is different from the world. Because if we are just the same, it is of no value. I am, um, yeah, I'll just leave that, but it has to be different, it has to be distinct. So when you're in your workplace or in your street or wherever it is that you're in your football team or wherever it is, it has to be something about you that's different. When you're on social media, it has to be something about you that's different has to be distinct from the world. And of course the distinction is, is in the Beatitudes that Sharon spoke about last week. The distinction is in every single word of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. That's the distinction. But it has to be there. We have to be different. We have to be Jesus-like in the world. And the third thing is that it has to be visible. There's um, a... <clears throat> A moment later in um, the sermon, where we'll, we'll look at this in a few weeks' time, no doubt, but um, where Jesus talks about prayer and fasting and giving, and he says, he says those things should be done in secret. But he doesn't say everything should be done in secret. There are certain things that have to be done publicly and have to be visible. Because Jesus says that actually if they're not, the, the reason they have to be visible is because it gives people an opportunity to see the source. The source is not our goodness. The source is Jesus and our gathering around him. And, but the, the good works that are visible give people an opportunity to recognize that and they give people an opportunity to give praise, Jesus says, to our Father in heaven. That's what he says. If you put your light under a bowl, nobody sees it. If you, put your, if you hide the good works, then nobody has the opportunity to give praise to your Father in heaven. That's what Jesus is saying. So actually as a church, um, we, have to, we want to be public. <laughs> we want to do things so people can see. Not so they give glory to us. Not so they go, wow, look at those people, aren't they amazing? but actually so that they have the opportunity to see that those things in some way point them towards God and they have an opportunity to bring praise to God. It's why things like the lard, it's why things like the kids' work that we do, it's why things like the warm space, it's so important that people see that we're doing them. Because people have an opportunity in that to respond to our Father and that's what we want for. So it has to be dispersed. So as you go to work tomorrow morning, be encouraged, because that is the dispersal of the salt throughout the world. It has to be distinct. Your thoughts, your speech, your actions, they have to be different. And it has to be visible. So that people can give praise to the Lord. So in a society that I think when generally left to its own devices will always be on a trajectory that leads us to decay. Jesus says to the ordinary people of Galilee and the ordinary people of Sherwood who have gathered around him, you are the salt and you are the light. You preserve, you cleanse, you flavour with heaven. 
And so go and be dispersed and do those things. Let's pray.